I would invite her to introduce to our honorable speaker. Over to you, Rida. Okay, um, hello everyone. Um, so it's a delight to introduce Professor Templeton today. Um, Professor Templeton is a chartered civil engineer and professor of public health engineering in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Imperial College London. His research focuses on addressing public health challenges related to water supply and sanitation and to date has collaborated on studies with partners in countries including Ethiopia, Tanzania, Ghana, Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire, Nepal and India. He is a fellow of the Institution of Civil Engineers in the UK and has served on expert advisory panels for a number of organisations, including the World Health Organisation, the Ethiopian Federal Ministry of Health, the UK's Global Challenges Research Fund and the Swedish Research Council. We are delighted to introduce Professor Templeton today. As you're all aware, the attendees of this talk will receive a certificate of attendance. Please, conform, uh, please complete the form, which I'll send in the chat um, before the meeting ends, so we can confirm your attendance and send your certificate. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to invite Professor Templeton to take the stage. Thank you very much. Mike, over to you. Okay, can you see that, um, Fayez? Excellent. Yep. Good. Okay, well, um, welcome everyone. Hello to everyone in uh, Pakistan, and, and thank you very much to uh, Fayez for the invitation to speak to you today. I think it's a really exciting vision for the University of Sustainable Sciences and um, the topic of my talk today is, is definitely very relevant to, to what you're tr trying to do through the university. Um, so my title is Pitfalls and Progress. What can we do in terms of research to move towards achieving safe and sustainable sanitation for all? Um, and so uh, we advance the slide here. Right. Um, what I'm going to be discussing today, uh, I've actually summarized in a, in a paper. Um, so if you um, uh, are interested in, in reading a bit more about any of the topics that I'm um, going to be discussing today, um, you can check out this paper. Um, which I think Fayez could also uh, point you to if, if you're interested. Um, and it's going to, su it summarizes a lot of the things that I'm going to be uh, discussing today. So, because um, we have limited time today, but that will give you some more information. Um, I'd like to give a, a sort of key message up front in case you have to leave the meeting or uh, you fall asleep or, or whatever happens during the presentation. Um, and I think one of the images I would like to hopefully have stay in your mind is this image of two school buses full of children. Okay, and I, I put this up because the current statistics um, suggest that about one, to two, so approximately one or two school buses full of children in terms of the equivalent of number of children under the age of five um, die every hour. So we'll die during the course of this one hour session uh, due to preventable diarrhea caused by inadequate water sanitation and hygiene. So this is really the motivation, the underlying motivation for the talk is, is, is how can we prevent this, this outrage really um, of this number of children who are dying regularly throughout the world um, and including many children in Pakistan, uh, sadly, because of um, inadequate access to water sanitation and hygiene, which we call WASH uh, for short. Um, and I'd like to make some sort of caveats or some um, you know, some uh, conditions in terms of uh, what I'm going to be talking about today. So um, as the introducer said, I, I'm an engineer. So my presentation today is from an engineer's perspective. Um, however, I recognize that many of you in the audience may not be engineers. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not going to be too technical in my, my talk today. Um, and it's important to recognize that uh, sanitation is really a multidisciplinary problem. It's not just an engineering problem. Uh, so there are lots of social, behavioral, educational, um, economic uh, issues that have to be overcome to achieve sustainable sanitation. 
Um, and really for sanitation interventions to be successful, you have to look at it from all of these different angles. Um, however, sometimes people say, well, that's that's fine, but there are, there are no engineering challenges left. There are no technical challenges left. And I think I would disagree with that. And I think um, I'll give you some examples in my talk today of where there are still some challenges that scientists and engineers uh, need to come up with solutions for to, to really achieve sustainable sanitation uh, for everyone. Um, also, I would say that sanitation has many benefits beyond health. So I've already been talking in terms of health, in terms of you know the children who die every, every hour because of ac uh, inadequate access uh, to wash. However, sanitation has many benefits beyond health. Um, and you're probably all aware of the sustainable development goals, um, which were set in 2015 and, and were meant to achieve them in 2030. And there is a sustainable development goal focused on clean water and sanitation, number six, which I've circled there. Um, however, if you look at the other goals there, you can realize that if you achieve uh, sustainable sanitation, you also make important contributions to other goals. Um, so good health and well-being is number three. Um, but also, for example, gender equality. A, a lot of the reasons for, uh, for example, um, uh, women and girls, uh, girls, for example, not being able to attend school is because they spend so much time managing water, you know, fetching water, looking after water for the household. Um, or if they don't have suitable facilities, you know, in schools um, uh, when they reach the age of menstruation, for example, that can be a barrier for women to attending school um, and, and progressing in their, in their future lives. So although we're focused here on water and sanitation, Sustainable Development Goal 6, and I'm mostly going to be talking about it from the health perspective, that it's important to recognize that there are many other benefits. And in fact, people might want to have improved sanitation for reasons that have nothing to do with health, really. It could be more to do with, uh, with privacy. It could be a status issue. Um, and, and really, it could also be sort of, you know, down to personal, personal dignity and, and privacy. So um, it's important to recognize that also. So this is a very basic um, image, um, which is, is from uh, a website uh, produced by WEDEC, which is a uh, a world leading center at Loughborough University in the UK. And it's, it's uh, not a very technical diagram, but it uh, I think shows very clearly something that we've probably all seen before, which is called a pit latrine, which is um, I think probably the most common toilet in the world um, for people who have toilets. Um, and under the Millennium Development Goals, this counted as an improved form of sanitation. So if you built one of these for someone uh, that contributed to the goal for access to improved sanitation. Um, however, in the sustainable development goals, um, the, the uh, focus is much more on sustainable sanitation. And so not just building something uh, that will work in the short term, but also thinking about the long term sustainability of it. So, for example, this pit latrine is, is probably very effective for containing the waste in the bottom of the pit, as you can see here. Um, but over time, of course, that pit is going to fill up uh, and there has to be a plan in place for when the pit fills up. So um, many people in the world, uh, you know, once that pit fills up, it, it's, a, it's a big problem for them. They, they might have to revert to open defecation. Uh, they might have to empty the pit somehow in a very uh, unsanitary and hazardous way for their health. Um, and sometimes, you know, when the latrine is emptied, the, the waste uh, is just released back into the environment, maybe dumped into a, a river or, or out, you know, somewhere in, in an unsafe um, disposal um, location. So th there has to be a lot more thinking about not just installing sanitation for right now, but also thinking about into the future, the management of the, of the latrine in the future. And um, another problem with these pit latrines is that they can pollute uh, groundwater also, as, as we're going to see later on in the presentation. So in, in a pit latrine, the solids are contained within the latrine, but the liquids flow out into the, into the soil so that the latrine doesn't become flooded with liquid. Um, and that can, can also um, bring contaminants into groundwater potentially if, if you're in an area that has a very high groundwater level. Okay, so this is probably the most common toilet in the world. Uh, it is an improved form of sanitation, um, but there are some challenges with it in terms of sustainability, um, I would argue. And this is sort of a really um, 
you know, diff these are difficult photos to look at, but really this is this is sort of at the heart of, of why we should be questioning whether existing forms of sanitation are really sustainable or safe. Um, because as, as we can see here, once the latrines are full, it then comes down to people to have to uh, empty those latrines. And, and quite often they don't have the facilities or the you know, personal protective equipment to do that safely. And, and it falls on some of the poorest people in communities uh, and the most marginalized people to, to do these jobs. Um, so again, is, is, you know, is it really smart for us to be putting in sanitation if, if we don't have a plan for, for the sustainable long-term use of it? Um, so I'm, I'm going to get into some of the research that we've um, done on some potential ways to solve some of these problems. And the first example is a project that was funded by uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, through the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, which my research group uh, was lucky enough to contribute to. Um, and we looked at whether you could adapt that pit latrine design to make it uh, ideal for worms to degrade the waste. So the idea was that you could put worms in the latrine and the worms would compost the waste as it went into the latrine uh, and they would form a sustainable uh, population and ecosystem within the latrine. And it would mean that the latrine would not fill up so quickly. So if, if the latrine might have filled up on, in say five years uh, under normal circumstances, we wanted to extend this to maybe you know, 30 years before it had to be emptied, for example. Um, and so uh, we called our, our latrine the tiger toilet, um, uh, not because it's a toilet for tigers, but because it uses uh, tiger worms, which are short, shown in the left side of the slide there. And they're, they're called tiger worms because they have stripes, stripes on them and they're, more or less a ubiquitous uh, worm. So, so they're a worm that's found all, all over the world. You don't, you don't have to bring the worms from the UK. You can use local worms. Um, and uh, again, the, the great thing about these worms is that they're very efficient at degrading waste. And they produce a residual material, which is essentially sterile. It's, it's, a, it's a, called a vermi compost material, which they produce as their waste product, which is very safe um, to, to empty eventually. So whenever you have a good idea, you have to start with some research. And we started initially with an experimental setup um, where we had uh, a water reservoir where we could put in the contents um, of the uh, liquid fraction that we are adding. And then we would introduce fresh feces from volunteers into the experimental setups that we had. And we were looking here at things like how many worms do you need uh, to, for the loading rates that we were providing uh, what are the ideal bedding ma matrix to keep the worms happy? Um, you know, how wet can the soil be? Does it have to drain very, very well? Um, all of these kinds of questions. And, and then we measured, you know, how quickly the toilets would fill up uh, with the worms or without the worms. And uh, this, is, this was the initial stage, but it's, it's, as I'll explain in a few minutes, it's now gone on to be actually implemented. Um, several hundreds or even thousands of these now implemented in households in, in India and, and other countries in the world. Um, and if you're interested in this particular topic, there's now actually an international organization which is focused on worm-based worm -based sanitation uh, technologies. And the website is given there in, on the bottom left of the slide. So it's uh, International Water-Based Sanitation Association, IWBSA.org. Um, and on there, it gives all kinds of links to how to design them, um, where they've been successful around the world, uh, and, and some more information on, on how, how to design them and how effective they are. So after we did these, uh, so to, to do these experiments, we, um, we did them in a place in, in, in Wales, called the, in the UK, called the Centre for Alternative Technology, where we were able to build some pilot scale uh, toilets. Uh, and for a while, one of them was actually running on the visitor center there to the center um, as an active toilet. And again, you know, when you start with research, you have to start under very controlled conditions. Um, so we, we set these up so that we could control things like temperature, uh, moisture level, how many worms were in there, um, et cetera. So these were the initial prototypes of the, the tiger toilet with the tiger worms in them. And um, uh, it's not going to be too technical a, a presentation, but um, every engineering presentation has to have at least one graph like this, one plot. Um, and this is a, a graph from an undergraduate student project actually from several years ago who went out to the pilot site in Wales to test some of these tiger toilets. 
And you can see that um, from the axis on the uh, X axis on the bottom that this study lasted for about uh, 80 days, uh, which is about the length of our undergraduate uh, thesis projects. And you can see that she was uh, basically measuring how much solid accumulation there was within some of the tiger toilets that had the worms in them and then equivalent toilets that didn't have the worms in them. So, so more like a typical pit latrine. Um, and you can see from the red line that the solids uh, built up um, in the uh, in the latrines as we would expect. And you know there was some degradation of the waste, um, but not not very much. Uh, and then in the blue line on the bottom, that's how quickly the solids were accumulating in the tiger toilets. Uh, everything else was the same except for the presence of the the worms under these optimized conditions that we had created. So you can see that that's very encouraging uh, because the fill rate is, is significantly lower, maybe sort of a third of, um, of, of the rate without the worms present. So that would suggest that if you could maintain this worm population, you could potentially extend the lifetime of the latrines for quite a long time. So after we had this, this prototype uh, information, you know, the next step in research is to go out to the real world and for that, we had colleagues who did quite a detailed study where they um, did a lot of interviews with, with potential um, users, potential buyers of these tiger toilets and, and tried to understand what were the important factors to them in the toilet design. Um, and so you can see the one of the surveys taking place there in, in India in the on the left. Uh, and then eventually, you know, we constructed um, some of these through, uh, there was a partnership with uh, local entrepreneurs and, and toilet um, manufacturers in India. Uh, and uh, this now has, as I said, has been constructed for many um, hundreds or even thousands of uh, households, um, mostly around um, uh, Pune in, in India, Maharashtra uh, province, India. And uh, from a research standpoint, this has provided now a, another interesting opportunity because now we can see how they're working in the field. And I'm able to send students out and, as you can see here, take the lid off one of the pit latrines or, sorry, one off of one of the tiger toilets and, and measure how quickly is the solid accumulating in there. And also, you know, are the worms uh, uh, still behaving as we would expect them to after several years of operation. So you can see from the latrine, you, you'd sit on top of the toilet here in the, the, the superstructure of the latrine, and then the waste would go out in this particular toilet through a poor flush toilet to the, uh, to the, to the container where the worms are based. Um, so you don't actually see the, the worms at all. The, the person who's using the toilet has no idea that there are worms below them, um, but it turns out that it's very effective for reducing this fill rate. And, uh, you know, we, uh, I don't wanna to be too technical, but we really wanted to try to model how, how quickly the toilets were filling up. So my students, you know, they used a laser pointer and they, they tried to measure the surface of the solids that were building up in many of these toilets over time and came up with a model for how quickly the latrines should fill up so that we can predict, you know, how long they're gonna last into the future before you need to, to empty them. And we also, I also sent a student out and he put infrared cameras in some of the, some of the containers that had the worms in them. Uh, and we were able to actually observe that the worms were still active after many years since installation and uh, get an idea of how quickly they were consuming the waste. And, Actually, we were surprised at how quickly they, they consume the waste that goes into these uh, toilets. And um, the users actually communicated to us that that was a good thing because actually it meant the smell, the, the odors were actually a lot lower than in, in pit latrines. Um, so that was, that was quite interesting also. Um, but I think the great thing about this was it showed us that it was a sustainable technology. You know, even after many years, the worms, the worm population was still very healthy and was still very effective in degrading the waste. Uh, and we didn't have to add any worms, you know, after the first uh, initial installation of the technology. So that was the tiger toilet. A second research project I'll quickly talk about is to do with uh, pollution of groundwater, as I said earlier. So a big problem that limits sustainability of sanitation in, in many countries is the fact that um, people are building these latrines on land which is maybe undesirable or cheap land. Maybe it's where people are in informal settlements, maybe they don't own the land. And quite often those uh, areas, they have high water tables. So that's part of the reason why they're, they're not very desirable areas. 
is that it's very difficult to actually dig very far into the ground before you hit water. Uh, and it might also be prone to flooding in some countries also. Um, so there's actually some good guidance from the World Health Organization in terms of where you should put toilets so that you don't pollute well water nearby if people are using well water for drinking water. Um, because if you're not careful about that, you could, you know, you might um, achieve a good thing in terms of the sustainable development goal for sanitation, but you might actually reduce access to clean drinking water if you're, if you're polluting nearby wells. Um, so in, there's good guidance from the World Health Organization about that, but that's mainly from the perspective of, of uh, microbial contamination of groundwater. So contamination with bacteria, which is coming from the, the human waste. But we were interested also in whether chemical pollution might be a problem. So um, a lot of human waste contains a lot of nitrogen in it. Um, both feces and urine actually has nitrogen in, in different forms. And a potential problem is that that waste would be um, nitrified over time, which means it, it, it forms nitrate, um, which is actually a pollutant, which is uh, dangerous for health. And it's also quite difficult to remove from water once it's in the water. Um, so we wanted to see whether we could come up with some guidelines for people in terms of um, uh, how they should cite latrines, uh, you know, and, and also what types of sanitation approaches would be sustainable in areas where you have high, high water tables and you might be polluting the water with nitrate. So we created a, a simple model here where we um, uh, took some measurements from the field to get an idea of what the nitrogen levels are in pits. And then we did a, it's called an advection dispersion model to try to, to model how, how that waste is going to pass into the, through the soil and into the groundwater. And so we were able to come up with some graphs like this, which I won't, I won't dwell on too much, but they basically allow us to figure out how long it's going to take for the nitrogen that was in the pit to reach different depths below the pit. Um, so on the, 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 the axis on the left there, on the y-axis, you can see the, the depth in meters. That's the depth below the, the bottom of the latrine. And we can measure you know, um, how, how long it's going to take for the nitrogen to pass into the, into the ground. And we complemented that modeling work with some work in Nepal, where we went around to three informal settlements, which had different types of wells and also different soil types, and also different management practices in terms of their latrines. And we measured the nitrogen in their wells and, and also took some samples from their latrines. Um, and we found some relationships, for example, that the households that were emptying their latrines more frequently um, they tended to have lower nitrogen um, concentrations in the wells that were nearby their latrines uh, compared to uh, other communities where they weren't managing the latrines in the same way. So there seemed to be a link, in other words, between a clear link between sanitation maintenance and operation and um, groundwater quality nearby. So that's something I think that's important to understand from a sustainability standpoint, especially in areas with high water tables is that the management of the latrines is actually quite important uh, in terms of reducing the risk of, of groundwater pollution. Um, another research area that I'm involved in is, is what do we do with the contents that we empty from pits? So how do we safely empty pits, pit latrines, and what do we do with the contents when, once we empty them? So you saw the images earlier, you remember, of the people sometimes getting you know, right down into the latrines to empty them, which is obviously very unsafe. And um, a number of people have come up with very clever ways of emptying latrines using things like bicycle pumps and, and you know, suction pumps, which don't require any um, uh, sort of external power source, some of them. An example there is the gulper technology from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, and you know, that might be especially applicable if you don't have a, a wide enough road where you could drive a vacuum um, um, a vacuum emptier down down into your toilet. So in the bottom right there, you know, that would probably be the ideal if you could drive a vacuum tanker in and, and they could put that down into your latrine to, to, to vacuum suction out the contents. Um, but that's not always possible, especially in informal settlements where the, you know, the space between houses is too small to really to fit into the, um, in, into the community. Um, so you know, a lot of people in the world don't have a sustainable way to empty their latrines. And even if they do have a sustainable way to empty their latrines, there isn't always a safe 
uh, disposal method for the contents. Um, so, you know, somebody might use this vacuum tanker to empty the latrine, uh, but then they might go dump it into a river or, or dump it into a, a drain, uh, which is really um, canceling out the positive benefits of sanitation because you're introducing a health risk back in, you know, to the community if you're doing that. Um, so there has to, we have to also think about uh, if you are able to empty the latrine safely, what do we do with the contents of the latrine to, to, to manage it safely? Um, and there's a lot of interesting work going on around the world in a number of countries, uh, which is basically saying that we shouldn't think of sanitation as a technology anymore, that we should think of it as a service. Okay, so that sanitation will only be sustainable if we think of it as a service instead of a technology. So instead of just giving someone a toilet, uh, maybe we should think of it more as um, a service. So, in, for example, in, in this business case, uh, the, the organization is called SOIL, which stands for Sustainable Integrated Organic Livelihoods. They provide a container-based toilet, and then they actually provide a service where they come by on a regular basis. You know, it might be weekly or every two weeks, and they'll take the container, uh, they'll take the, uh, you know, part of the container away that has the waste, and they'll give you a fresh container. So it's, it's almost like collecting rubbish, uh, you know, on, on a regular basis. And the idea is that they take that waste away and they, they collect it, they transport it, and then they do something beneficial with the waste so that they can produce a product which actually has some value. And, and that's actually sort of the business model for how, it, how it's sustainable. So people would not pay to buy the toilet, they would pay to use the toilet on a use basis. And um, the business would recover the costs by uh, producing some valuable products. Those valuable products might be biogas, for example, or, or uh, which could be converted to electricity, or it could be, in this case, it's um, they're making fertilizers or soil enhance enhancer from the waste um, and, and selling that on to, to farmers, for example. Okay, so this is a nice, this is a nice example, and, and it's, it's good because, as I say, it's, it's um, more sustainable because it's thinking about the whole chain of management of the sludge, not just not just giving someone a toilet, but thinking about how you're going to manage the, the waste um, in, in a sustainable way. So this has been attempted in a number of countries now and in a number of different communities. And I think it's quite interesting and something to look at in, in new locations also and, and to think about, is this going to work everywhere? You know, why, why will it work in some places? Why would it not work in other places? Um, and this is maybe something you might want to think about in, in Pakistan also, is, is whether that's um, achievable. Oh, somebody just uh, highlighted something on the screen there, I see. Um, okay, well, well, we'll keep going. Um, or Fayez, I don't know, can you remove? Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Um, so the next slide is just to, sh to give an example of what we could do that's beneficial from, from the waste. So let's say we can collect it um, safely and we can transport it safely and, and now we have the waste and we're going to try and get some valuable products from it. Um, and one thing traditionally that people have done is to recover biogas and you know biogas recovery is quite quite well known in the wastewater treatment field um, but there's less experience I'd say with um, directly using household waste from from pit latrines for example or, or septic tanks. Um, and you can see from this table that actually there's there is a good amount of biogas, of, of methane, that you can recover from human, human excrement, um, less than pig or cow uh, manure. Um, and one solution might be actually to, co to collect the animal manure and, and actually to co-digest it with the human waste in order to recover more biogas in, in a more sustainable way. Um, but this, this table here gives you an example of how much biogas in terms of volume you'd be able to get per person per day. Or, or per animal per day. Um, and really, uh, the number of biogas plants domestically um, has increased uh, significantly, uh, sort of in the past 20 years. Um, and especially most of the growth was in India and, and China. Um, and a, a lot of people actually with household biogas digesters, they use it to make biogas for cooking. So you, can, you could li uh, link it to a biogas stove, as you see here in the, the diagram here. Um, uh, which is a photo from a, a colleague, um, uh, Dr. Rosa, uh, from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, 
and shows that you know if you can do that you're actually also providing a benefit because then people don't have to burn dirty fuels when they're cooking so you, so you're achieving a side benefit um it's that said i would say it's not a suitable technology for everywhere and and to make it sustainable actually maintenance has to be really seriously considered so there are a lot of advantages to the biogas recovery as you can see here um, but there are also some disadvantages and there are a lot of examples where actually it has it has broken down over time you know people haven't been able to fix them um, it's also not particularly suitable in certain climates cold and, and arid climates because the digestion doesn't work as effectively um, so it's I, I would say it's an area where there's still still um, some opportunities for innovation to try to make it an even more sustainable um, option uh, but it's one very good option for trying to recover uh, value from, from the waste from sanitation. Um, at Imperial, we're also doing some research currently into another technology, which is called pyrolysis. Um, and here, again, you would add fecal sludge from latrines, but you could also maybe mix it with other forms of biomass, maybe from crops, from agricultural crop waste, um, or from municipal waste or sewage sludge. And then you could do this process called pyrolysis, which is, is basically um, a, a decomposition process in the absence of oxygen. Um, and this pyrolysis process, instead of producing biogas, you would aim to produce either bio oil, which is another form of fuel, um, or a char. Um, and the, the biochar, as you can see there, the picture on the bottom of the screen, um, that could be used for soil amendment to improve soil quality, for example. Um, or it could be used as a fuel. Um, some people have looked at it as a water treatment technology also. So um, pyrolysis is kind of interesting because it could produce lots of different types of products which might be applicable in different markets. Um, and I, I don't want really to dwell on this um, too, too much, but we did a study where we showed um, uh, what you have to do to the waste to make the pyrolysis process uh, energy positive. So. Uh, you know, if, if you're going to start up a business uh, using pyrolysis and you're going to sell the energy for the bio oil, for example, that's the product from the pyrolysis, you want to make sure that you're actually producing more energy than you're using uh, in the process. Uh, otherwise, it's a, it's a losing uh, cause. It's a lost cause. Um, and we showed that actually you have to be quite clever about drying the sludge before you put it into the pyrolysis uh, and achieve... Um, less than 55% water content of the waste if you're going to actually have a net benefit in terms of the um, energy recovery from the pyrolysis. So it's important to do a bit of, uh, a bit of experimentation before you, you, you know, try it out at full scale to, to make sure from a back of the envelope uh, calculation, from a simple calculation, whether it's actually going to produce enough uh, net positive energy for you or not. And then the last few slides are going back to health again, which is what I started the presentation about. And I have a lot of um, research currently, which is looking at a disease, which um, thankfully is not very, not very common in Pakistan, but actually there's about 200 million people in the world who are infected with this disease, which is called schistosomiasis. It's a bit hard to say. So I'll call it schisto uh, for short, okay? Uh, and it's, as I say, about 200 million people in the world who are affected by this disease, and about 90% of them are in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa. And it's, um, it's an interesting disease because um, people who are infected, if they don't have proper sanitation, uh, their urine and their feces goes out into the environment. And uh, if there are certain types of snails in the water bodies, in the, in the lakes uh, or rivers nearby, the snails become infected with the parasite and they actually produce another uh, form of the parasite, which can then infect other people. So this is a disease which has existed for thousands of years. Um, even in Egypt, in the uh, the mummies in Egypt, they've they've found uh, calcified eggs from the the parasite of this disease. So we know it's been around for thousands of years. And basically, uh, there are drugs which can treat the disease these days. However, they're not vaccines. So if you don't have good sanitation and, and water you're going to become reinfected all the time from this disease. So if you had sanitation, it would, it would break the, the life cycle because you would, stop the, you would stop the contamination of water and therefore you would stop the snails from becoming infected and you would stop other people from becoming infected. 
However, if you if you look at the if you talk to biologists, and again, this is why multidisciplinary research is very important, you'd realize that it only takes one egg to infect one snail, and that would produce twenty thousand of the parasites which infect people. Um, so, in other words, if you had a community of a hundred people, and let's say ninety nine of them had a toilet, but one of them didn't have a toilet. And that one person was was ill with this disease and was still uh, defecating or urinating into water. Um, it would be almost the same as if nobody had a toilet because of the fact that this snail, once the snails when they become infected, they they shoot out about twenty thousand of the parasites per snail, um, which means that the water still has a very high level of contamination and risk associated with it. So it's important when you think about sanitation that you think about uh, the community level of coverage that you're going to need in order to achieve improved health. You know, if you, if you just give toilets to two or three people in a community, it's unlikely that you're going to improve the health in the overall community very much because there's still a lot of waste, you know, in the community. Uh, and in the case of this particular disease, it, it seems that to achieve any kind of improvement in health, you probably have to have very, very high levels of community coverage of sanitation. Um, otherwise, the disease is very, very efficient at continuing to, to spread. So um, we did a study initially where we looked at all of the literature on water and sanitation. And some of these considered children only, some of them considered adults and children. And we basically tried to tell whether we could see whether people with improved water or sanitation had lower risk of in, uh, infection from this disease. And basically, we did find that from about 200 studies that had been done previously in different countries around the world, that there was a statistical link, there was a relationship between having a toilet and or or having drinking water, safe water, uh, not drinking water, but safe, safe water um, and reduced infection with the disease. Um, and we then decided to look into this in a bit more detail. And we did a, we're part of a huge study in Ethiopia, which went into about 1600 schools in Ethiopia, 1600 schools. And there was health information, health data collected from 50 children in each of those schools. So there was about 80,000 children in total who participated. And we also went into the schools and we tried to um, quantify how good was the sanitation in those schools. And, if you think about this, it's it's not really a trivial thing. So how how would you how would you tell whether sanitation was good or not, whether the toilets were good or not within a, within a school? How, how would you quantify that, and and make it comparable from one school to another? And so uh, in in the research that we did, we came up with a, a score, a, a way of quantifying the the goodness of the sanitation in these schools. So we asked questions like, do boys and girls share the same toilet? Uh, is there a door on the toilet? How clean are the walls? How clean is the floor? Um, are there flies? Are there odors? Um, and that allowed us, again, to, to be able to quantify um, and be able to compare the quality of sanitation in schools. And the reason why it was important to quantify it was that we could then do some really rigorous statistics to link the quality of the sanitation to the infection data that we had, the health data for the 80,000 kids. Uh, and here it was interesting because we actually found that the quality of the sanitation did not link to schistosomiasis, but it did link to other types of um, helminth diseases. So other types of worms like hookworm, um, for example. So this is data from Ethiopia in 2013 and 14. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about the project, there's a website down here called uh, wiserschisto.com and it gives uh, a lot of information, the papers that have been published, and, and also lots of nice images of the fieldwork um, and, and updates on the fieldwork that we've been doing. Um, and actually, I think, you know, as it says there, it, we, weren't, we weren't too surprised that we didn't see a link with schistosomiasis because actually, as I said earlier, it would take very, very high levels of coverage of sanitation before you would expect to see a measurable impact on, on schistosomiasis. Um, and, and also there are lots of other factors that could cause the spread of the disease besides just sanitation. So I'm just, this is my, uh, almost my last slide, I think. And, and I guess the, the main messages I'd like you to try to remember, I guess, from my presentation. The first one is that scientists and engineers have important roles to play in achieving the sustainable development goals. 
uh, and to achieve sanitation for all um, in, specifically. Um, it's not something that scientists and engineers can solve by themselves, but I think they have a very important and, and maybe central role to play really alongside other disciplines. Um, basic pit latrines like the one I showed at the beginning, they are better than having nothing, but they do have some challenges associated with them. Like they will fill up eventually and they could contaminate groundwater. It's always important if you're developing a new technology or a new sustainable solution that you talk to the end users, that you talk to the people who are going to use the technology. And actually you should involve them right from the beginning of your, of your work. Because if you create a technology which nobody wants to use or nobody can afford to use, uh, it's, it's not going to be an effective um, solution. Uh, the fourth bullet there is make sure that you contain the waste whatever approach you use, but don't forget the long-term fate of the waste. So where is it going to end up eventually? Who's going to have to empty it? You know, where is it going to go if it's emptied? And really, is it really waste? Should we maybe be thinking of it more as an opportunity to recover value and recover uh, you know, monetary value maybe from, from the waste if we can do that in a safe and sustainable way? And then finally, going back to health again, sanitation is really uh, an important part of the puzzle, but it's only a piece of the, of the puzzle. And how effective it's going to be to improve health is going to depend uh, on the disease and also the levels of coverage and usage of sanitation within communities. Um, so I guess don't, you know, if you go into a community and put in a few toilets, don't be discouraged if you don't see immediate impacts on, on health, because probably it is having a beneficial impact, but actually it may be the case that you have to achieve much uh, larger levels of coverage within the community of sanitation, you know, more toilets, uh, and also maybe more consistent usage of those toilets within, within the community. So again, to finish, uh, bear in mind the image that we started with that, you know, in, in the course of this hour, somewhere around one or two school bus full of children, approximately under the age of five, will, will have died because of inadequate water sanitation and hygiene including many children in Pakistan, sadly. So, uh, you know, that that's hopefully should be motivation for us all to pursue sustainable science and engineering to, to improve sanitation. Um, some acknowledgements and credits, lots of researchers and contributors, many funders and partners in the research that was produced. And a lot of the photos and images that I, that I showed come from colleagues. Uh, or other sources of information. So I've, I've just acknowledged the, the credits there for those images. Um, and I'm happy, um, Fayez, if you'd like to, uh, I think, share the PDF of this or if it's, if it's on Facebook or something through the video. Um, but if you're interested in some further reading about any of the, any of the topics or any of the research projects that I talked about, um, there's, a, there's a reference list there where you could, you could access more information. Okay, that's it for me. Um, thank you, Mike. A very fascinating talk. I must say I have learned, despite being in water engineering, I have learned a lot from your presentation, especially the practical aspects, the research, the direction the research is going in. Um, we do acknowledge <laughs> you as well, because we saw the slide on acknowledgements. Um, now, I think we have to take a few questions and then we start that process. Uh, now, 40 participants doing it virtually is kind of a challenge, but uh, learning on from the previous experiences for all my participants, if you look at your screens, you should have one participant tab. If you click on that, in there you will find a button raise hand. If you raise your hand, then I will be knowing who is that person then I will call upon your name and then you can ask question. Is that clear? I think it would be clear before uh, people um, um, overcome the technological uh, uh, issues. Uh, I think I have got one burning, um, I got lots of questions, but the one which is very timely, um, how about the research direction on sanitation and COVID-19? Yeah, that's a good uh, good question. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of work going on, uh, not just in academia, but also from uh, organizations in countries who implement sanitation. And I think this is a real opportunity, actually, COVID, for the water and sanitation community to really, you know, make a lot of progress towards the sustainable development goals because it's clear that, uh, you know, being able to wash your hands, having access to clean water. 
is is crucial really and you know that's the advice from governments you know wash your hands but that's not very practical for people all the time um also a lot of people you know they have to share toilets so they might rely on community toilets uh and and that's also quite difficult if, if you're trying to self-isolate or not spread the disease so um I, I don't think that we need new technologies necessarily for for sanitation for covid but i think it's more about making sure that everyone has access to safe safe water and sanitation and hygiene facilities mm -hmm. yeah I can see we've got lots of questions coming in. Uh, so shall we start with, we have got one from Usman Bha. Usman, could you please unmute yourself and ask the question? Okay, good morning, everybody. Hello. Hello, good yes, morning, you are on. Mr. Good morning, Mr. Templeton. Good morning. I mean, in your introduction, if my memory can serve me well, I heard Senegal in one of the countries this project is, and I've not heard Gambia, and Senegal and Gambia are borders. And in the Gambia here, we have many pit latrines. So I would like to know if you have any plans to reach the Gambia, because we will be very delightful to receive such a project. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. That's that's a great uh, that's a great invitation. I, I haven't been to Gambia before, but I, I, I have done a lot of work in West Africa in uh, Sierra Leone and Ghana and um, Senegal, as you said, and Cote d'Ivoire and Benin. Um, but uh, yeah, if, if you would like to send me a, an email, it'd be great to look at how we how we could um, could collaborate. Uh, it's true that the problems are really common to many countries around the world. Um, and um, uh, yeah, I hope the talk today was helpful to your situation in Gambia also. Osman, uh, yeah, that's it's good. It's uh, very, very helpful. Thanks. Yes, I mean, now you can uh, write us an email. You have uh, our University of Sustainable Sciences email. We will try and ensure that we put both of you in touch as well. Uh, on Gambia, which is very interestingly, I have got a couple of projects on uh, water consumption, on smart water meters uh, uh, in the rural area where we are providing prepaid tokens for people to collect water. Uh, and then that uh, generated resources then used for the uh, service maintenance and so on and so forth. Quite fascinating stuff. Moving on to the next question, we have uh, from Imran Ali Channa. Could you please uh, unmute your mic? Imran? We can't hear you to I think there are some connection issues until Imran gets them started. We move on to the next question, which is from Jankoba. Okay, who is it? Jankoba? Yeah, yeah. Hello, good morning, everybody. Yes, please. Kelly, I'm Jankoba. Yeah, this is Jankoba. Hello. I am, yes. Yes, hello. I can hear you. Good. I am also from the Gambia. I also wanted to ask the same question with uh, what Usman, Usman already asked about you people. So okay. it, will, it, it will be important if you can have the same project in the Gambia because I think we are among the countries that uh, the sanitation is really a problem in the Gambia. So I, it was the same question I was going to ask. So I think it has been answered already. Okay. Very good. Thank you. I could add yeah. something, Fayez. Yes. Yeah. Um, just that, um, you know, for, for a lot of the research in sanitation uh, and, and the research that we've done, even though we've studied it in certain countries, we always tried to make it very general so that it could be applied in other countries also. So, um, so for example, the tiger toilet, you know, the, the worm-based uh, toilet that doesn't fill up very quickly, um, all of the designs and the information behind that is all available online. So, you know, in theory, you could, you could go online and, and actually apply the same technology in your country um, and, and, you know, use the learning from other countries and, and just apply it to, to your country using using your own materials 
uh, and your own worms, for example, in that in that case. Um, so yeah, hopefully you can hopefully you can access some of the websites and things that I included in the in the presentation because um, th there's a lot of useful information that you could use there to apply directly in, in the Gambia and other countries. Very good. Um, next question comes from Mohammad Farooq. Farooq, please unmute yourself. Assalamualaikum, sir. Hello. Hello. Are you hearing me? Yes. Uh, sir, my question to, uh, is uh, I am from Dow University of Engineering and Technology in Energy and Environment. Uh, so today my uh, question is, I am working on a project uh, with the name of uh, uh, Sustainable Cities and Communities. So I want to ask that uh, what are the uh, main, uh, should be main important uh, task for the men uh, for a, uh, sustainable cities and communities. What we should do, uh, what we should the ideas about the uh, smart cities in the desert areas like uh, uh, <laughs> Pakistan have many uh, areas like deserts in Thar, ATC. So how we can work for this in uh, uh, sustainable cities in the desert area? What should be the ideas about sanitation? So can you give me idea? Right. Okay. So I think the question was about desert desert areas, right? Sanitation in desert areas. Yeah. Do Do you mean you mean desert or or deserted deserts? Deserts or desert. Like with sand on the ground. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, sanitation in desert areas is quite a challenge because you know it's difficult to dig uh, latrines into sand. Um, um, so. You might be looking, for example, at facilities that are maybe raised above ground, for example. Um, so I've, I've seen examples of that before. Um, so instead of digging into the ground, you would maybe have a container above ground and people would walk up to it. Um, but um, you still, I guess, a lot of this, the same sort of considerations would apply, though, in terms of you, you would want to think about how affordable it is for the people and, and also how sustainable it will be in, in the long term. Um, so you, you would still, I think, want to be thinking about uh, what's going to be the long term fate of the waste. You know, is, is someone going to provide it as is going to collect it as a service uh, using, for example, one of those container based technologies, maybe? Um, or will people just, you know, build new toilets when they fill up? Um, so uh, I think it's, it's, yeah, I think you'd probably would have to be creative in terms of the latrine design, but, but otherwise a lot of the maintenance and management um, lessons that have been learned, I think would still apply in desert communities also. I hope that's helpful. Thank you, Michael. I think the time is beating uh, is upon us. Now, I would to encourage younger participations uh, as an exception. I will go for three more questions because there is lots of interest and very brief answers as well. That will be very helpful. So the first one comes back. We go back to the Imran Ali Channa. Can you unmute yourself? Uh, yes, I will. Uh, I think uh, it's still hello, you've got hello, the sir. same issues. Can you type your question? Then we will put to our uh, uh, distinguished speaker. Moving on to Awafal. Awafal, are you there? Yes, I am. Please. Good morning. Good morning. Morning. Um, I am from the Gambia. Um, I wanted to ask a simple question regarding um, this tip latrine thing, because a lot of people around um, here normally um, dig up um, boreholes. So most of their houses um, have this um, pit latrine. Is there any possible chances that they're drinking um, unhealthy water or polluted water from their pit latrine? Yes, yes is the short answer. Yes, it, um, there, you know, there is a risk of latrines contaminating uh, well water. It depends how deep your well is. Uh, if the wells are very, very deep, uh, tube wells, for example, then they might be okay. But if they're very shallow wells, 
uh, like hand dug wells, for example, um, or, um, the, probably the risk is higher in that case. And, and the closer that they are together, the higher the risk. So it might be something that you would want to investigate, I think, maybe, maybe measure the quality of the water um, and, and also how deep the, the water is below ground would be the important things. Thank you. Uh, the next one is from Ghulam Mushtaba, Daud University. Thank you very much. I think it was great presentation. Uh, I you. would like to ask if we go towards the sustainable sanitation, what do you think, what kind of challenges we normally face uh, if we convert the traditional pit method to, you know, sustainable method? So what kind of challenges or uh, issues we can be normally faced? Yeah, okay. Um, so um, I think probably the first thing I would say is, is uh, if you're going to adopt some of these innovative approaches, it's important that you deal with the users. So I think a lot of the challenge, um, you, you know, some, some of the technical solutions exist already, but I think it's important that you, first of all, talk to the users of the sanitation to figure out, you know, what are their most important challenges and also what, what are the things that they most want from their toilets and are willing to pay for their toilets. Um, because there's a lot of examples of, of sort of people developing new sustainable technologies and then they don't work because the users, you know, don't accept them or, or can't afford them. So. I think that that's the number one challenge and where I would suggest, you know, you, you sort of start is, is maybe look at the solutions that exist and, and maybe discuss those with the people who are, you're intending to use them and, and see, you know, what they think of them basically. Are, are, are they things that they're comfortable with and that they would be willing to, to support? Mm. Okay. Thank you, Mike. The mm. last one, um, uh, that is from Nazir Hussain. Nazir, can you hear us? Yes, sir. Um, Please I'm speak here. up a bit. Uh, okay, sir. Uh, sir, I am uh, Nazir, graduated from uh, Qaeda University, Norsha. My question is that I am living in the countryside of uh, Pakistan, where the people uh, even don't know about the sanitization and what is sanitizer. How can I educate them to use sanitizer and uh, the benefits of sanitization? Can you please? Yeah, yeah, that's that's an excellent question. I mean, as I said at the beginning, I'm, I'm an engineer. I'm, I'm not a social scientist, but there is a lot of guidance. Uh, if you if you go, for example, to the web page of the WHO, the World Health Organization, or the or the UN, even the United Nations, um, there's a lot of information about uh, health education and behavior change, and it's it's quite country specific. So I mean, I think you you might have to adapt it to the people that you are in contact with. And, and you know, you have to understand their culture, what, what things are acceptable to them, which, which things are not acceptable to them. Um, but uh, I think instead of, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of good guidance out there on, on how to achieve health education around sanitation. Um, and uh, probably don't have time to, to get into it too much here, but um, um, yeah. Hopefully, hopefully you will be able to find some some specific information on that. It's very important that you do, you know, do that health and education uh, before you think of any kind of technical solutions, because otherwise, it just won't make sense to the to the community people. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Fayaz, are you still there? Yeah, Fayaz, are you there? Yeah, I'm there. <laughs> all right. Okay. So one of the last, uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank Mike uh, for uh, taking time. And we do realize that making impressive presentations do take considerable amount of preparation and time. And then very well done, Mike. And we do appreciate your time today, despite uh, on Sunday. And I'm sure it is going to send lots of key messages, uh, take home messages to people. Uh, one of the last slides you showed us that uh, so, so many people, uh, our children get affected. Now the WHO 
uh, statistics is like that every 20 seconds, somewhere in the world, a child dies just because of waterborne diseases, uh, which can be prevented. And every one of us can do by doing little things and simple things, and we can make a huge impact. Uh, so